Today we're going to talk about a very interesting and wild story that involves a group of mentally unstable people that strapped a destructive device to a man's neck and told that man the only way to get the device off his neck was to walk into a bank and demand bags of cash. This is the story of Marjorie Deal Armstrong and a group of disturbed individuals. The story starts out in Erie, Pennsylvania, where a woman named Marjorie lost her mother. Her father, however, who was an old man, couldn't spend all the money that was saved up over time, so he shared it with his friends and family. Some of the valuables he shared used to be in a safe deposit box in a bank. Marjorie hated the bank and her father both as she blamed the bank for giving her father access to the safe deposit box, and she blamed her father for spending the money she thought should have been her inheritance, and for that, she wanted her father six feet underground but she needed someone to do the job. Her old friend Kenneth would do the job, but he needed $200,000 for a job well done. She didn't have a quarter million laying around the house, so she devised a plan to get the money by seeking revenge on the bank. So sometime around July 2003, Marjorie and a man named Bill met up at Ken's house to discuss a plan to rob the bank so she could get the money to pay Ken to get rid of her father. Who is Kenneth Barnes? Kenneth was a man that was addicted to hardcore substances like and cocaine. He lived in a filthy house with furniture, food, animal feces, and mildew to the point that the floor was not visible and you couldn't find anything. The only thing you could find was a dirty mattress on the second floor where all the ladies would make a few bucks to pay for their bad habits. While they were on Kenneth's front porch, one of the ladies overheard the conversation about the bank robbery and they asked her if she knew someone that was timid enough to persuade to become a getaway driver. That lady was a woman named Jessica. At the time, Jessica was addicted to many different hardcore substances and said, yes, I know someone. And with that, she sealed the fate of one of her favorite customers. His name was Brian Wells, a regular guy who worked as a pizza delivery driver. Marjorie paid Jessica hundreds of dollars, and in return, Jessica gave Marjorie Brian's name, phone number, his work schedule, and other details that was needed to bring the plan together. Jessica spent the money on her favorite substances and stayed high for a week straight. The next month, in August, Marjorie's living boyfriend, James, had second thoughts when the conversation of a bank robbery started to become reality and so he changed his mind and didn't want to be involved anymore. And for that, Marjorie grabbed a 12-gauge and unloaded. He didn't make it. James, however, wouldn't be the first boyfriend that Marjorie got rid of. Fifteen years earlier, back in 1988, she was acquitted of a murder she committed in 1984. In that case, she unloaded six times while her boyfriend was chilling on the couch. His name was Robert. He didn't make it. And for that, she claimed self-defense and received probation. Who is Marjorie? Marjorie was a valedictorian who went on to attain her master's degree in education and a bachelor's degree in sociology and a gold star for boyfriends and being a woman who had five men in her life pass away under suspicious circumstances. Although she was smart, she was dangerous and mentally disturbed. She was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, which is a mental illness that causes unusual shifts in a person's mood, energy, activity levels, and concentration. She was also diagnosed with a personality disorder, which sometimes can be characterized by a lack of guilt and an inability to form lasting relationships. She lived the life of a hoarder with furniture, food, and animal feces all over the house. She was disgusting. It was said she was the type of woman that you can smell from two blocks away. As for Bill, he was no different. He was smart. His part in the scheme was to build a device that would be forever known as a collar. It was a device that worked like a handcuff. It locked itself around a person's neck and connected to it was two pipe bombs that were connected to a timer. On August 27th, the crew met up at Bill's house to make final plans for what would take place the following day. One of the crew members was a man named Floyd. At the time, Floyd was living at Bill's house as he was on the run for a 
case for doing the unthinkable to a disabled teenage girl. Like I said earlier, this is a crew of disturbed individuals. On the day of the event, on August 28, 2003, about 1.30 p.m., Bill used a payphone at a gas station to call the pizzeria where Brian worked as a delivery driver. He ordered two pizzas and requested they be delivered at the end of a long driveway leading to a secluded television satellite tower located right down the block from Bill's house. A witness would later testify they saw Bill, Marjorie, and Kenneth at the same gas station at around the same time when the order for the pizza was placed. Kenneth would also be recorded on a time-stamped video at the gas station, the same time Bill made the call. Around 1.45 p.m., Marjorie and Bill waited at the gas station to see when Brian would pass by on his way to deliver the order. Fifteen minutes later, about 2 p.m., Kenneth, Marjorie, Bill, and Floyd waited for Brian to show up at the secluded satellite tower. When Brian exited his car, they told him what was about to happen, and when he resisted, Bill pulled out a gun and unloaded one round to force him to comply. Law enforcement would later find a weapon in Bill's car, and it was missing one round. Kenneth and Marjorie continued to assault Brian while Floyd placed the device around his neck. Brian was scared and was told the only way to get the device off his neck was to go to the bank give them the letter demanding $250,000 and bring the money back to them. And if he gets caught, well, his instructions was to tell law enforcement some black guys did it. Not knowing what else to do, Brian complied, and around 2.20 p.m. he walked into the bank with the device strapped around his neck and a note demanding $250,000. He walked up to the bank teller, raised his shirt to show them the device, but since bank tellers don't have $250,000 up front, he left with less than $9,000 in cash. Marjorie and Kenneth were seated in a car in a parking lot across the street, looking at Brian through binoculars, as he walked out of the bank 12 minutes after he entered. At 2.38 p.m., someone called 911 and reported what just happened, and a few minutes later, law enforcement pulled him over, pulled him out of the car, and handcuffed him with his hands behind his back. Brian then did as instructed and told law enforcement that he was abducted by a group of black men who attached a device to his neck. When they realized that the device was real, they called in the B squad to disarm the device. While waiting for the B squad to show up, Brian said, I don't have a lot of time. 20 minutes would pass by and the device started beeping. In his own words, Brian said, it's going to go off. I'm not lying. And a few seconds after the beeping started, the inevitable happened. It went off. He didn't make it. Brian was an innocent man that didn't deserve what happened to him. Brian had a co-worker. His name was Robert Panetti. And Robert was scheduled to be interviewed by law enforcement on the fourth day after the event. But the evening before the interview, Robert didn't make it. It happened while he was in his home and under mysterious circumstances. It was eventually ruled some kind of over. Around two weeks later, around September 14th, 2003, Bill went to a landfill and got rid of any evidence linking him to the building of the destructive device that was placed around Brian's neck. Remember James, the boyfriend that Marjorie murdered with the 12 gauge? Well, Bill helped her after the fact. He had a freezer in his garage and they decided to use it. Marjorie wanted Bill to then purchase an ice crusher so they could crush James into tiny pieces. But Bill couldn't do it. So in the week of September 21st, he picked up the phone and told law enforcement what Marjorie did to James and what he did after the fact. This is Bill showing law enforcement what he did with James and the freezer and explaining how he did it. Marjorie was then arrested and she wasn't going quietly. She immediately told police that Bill had something to do with what happened to James. 
But what law enforcement didn't know was what she told them next. Marjorie told them that Bill also had something to do with what happened to Brian a month earlier, and this piece of information was new to law enforcement. She would eventually be charged with what was done to James and sentenced to 7 to 20 years in prison. While Marjorie was serving time, she kept disclosing information about Bill's involvement in building the device and his part in the planning of the event. After investigators went back to the recording of Bill showing them around his house and garage, they noticed some of the papers in the video had drawings and writings that matched evidence found in a bank robbery letter and other documents used in the crime related to Brian Wells' case. But by then, it was too late. Bill was already gone. He was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and less than a year after the event, in July of 2004, he didn't make it. Bill was 60 years old. Five years after the event in 2008, for his part, Kenneth was sentenced to 45 years in prison. Eight years after the event, in 2011, for her part, Marjorie was sentenced to life plus 30 years in prison. Six years after that sentence, Marjorie expired in a cold prison cell in April 2017, which was 14 years after the event. She was 68 years old. As for Kenneth Barnes, the dealer with the mattress on the second floor, he expired in June 2019 in a cold prison cell. 16 years after the event. He was 72 years old. As for Floyd Stockton, he was the last one to go. The convicted is who served time for doing the unthinkable to a disabled teenager. Even though he was the one to put the device around Brian's neck, he received immunity for his cooperation against Marjorie. He expired in August 2022 as a free man, 19 years after the event. He was 74 years old. Rest in peace to Brian Wells. This was the story of Marjorie Deal Armstrong and a group of disturbed individuals. If you enjoy this content, click on the next episode from Big City Crime TV.